How many of you are happy? Now I'm going to say, define happiness. What's happiness? Give me a word for happiness. Simplicity. Simplicity. Define happiness. Content. Content. Define happiness. My apartment. Oh, your apartment. <laughs> Who is happy over here? What's happiness? Well-being. Oh, well-being. That's just an easy way out. That's a cop-out. Yes, sir. Balance with, with yourself. Balance with yourself. Do you know what that means? Yeah. <laughs> Define happiness. Living your values. Living your values. What? Hello, welcome on board. Do have Hello. a seat. <laughs> right. Living your values. Balance. What's that? What? Service. service. What does that mean, service in a restaurant? <laughs> hmm? Help people. Help people. What? Pleasant. Pleasant. Fine. Yes? Gratitude. What? Gratitude. Gratitude. Things are going downhill fast here. <laughs> yeah, go on. Sleep well. Sleep well. Love. Love. No one's added. What about money? Yeah. All right, our panel. You've come to hear them, not hear me. Uh, Lord Richard Layard's here uh, from the LSE. John Halliwell, Professor John Halliwell's here uh, from the Canadian Institute. And Geoffrey Sachs from Columbia University. I don't do long introductions, mainly because if I do, I'll get them wrong. And all three gentlemen are experts. You've heard their definitions of happiness. Start with you, uh, John Halliwell. You've heard their definitions of happiness. Are they right? I, I'm going to run a survey. <laughs> are you happy? Yes. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Now, for the survey to be done right, it, it's, we've got to get the answers right in the survey. It's not me singing and us clapping, it's us singing and us clapping. Can you handle that? Okay. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. There you go. Go on. Cartoon of the class of, of children clapping their hands, except for one of them, and the teacher says, he is happy, but he doesn't know it. Exactly. <laughs> Jeffrey Sachs, have we lost touch with reality here? <laughs> no, no, we're doing fine. <laughs> but we're talking about a certain kind of happiness when we do that, which is that we're happy in the moment. And uh, the answers that we're also given is about happiness in life, and one of the key points of the research that uh, these gentlemen and other people in the happiness research have shown is that there's the kind of emotional happiness that we're all smiling and feeling good. We always do when Richard is uh, chairing us. Uh, but we also uh, think about deeper meaning. And there, I think the answers that we're given are all correct. There's not a single definition Happiness is a life well lived. And for me, it goes back to Aristotle, 2,300 years ago. He got it very well. And all of the points that were made, whether it's friendship, balance, uh, material uh, goods, right. health, were all part of his idea of thriving back in the Nicomachean ethics. You can look it up, it's celebrating its. 2300th anniversary, uh, and it uh, was a pretty good start on all of this. Why does it matter, and where, uh, Richard, did this sudden interest in happiness come from? I mean, for, all right, Aristotle, fine, let's leave Aristotle on right. the back burner. No, I, I, I'd rather start with the 18th century, because the 18th century brought us out of the age of superstition into the modern age, and the most important single idea in the 18th century was that the definition of progress was that people were happy and enjoying their lives and there wasn't too many people in misery. And this has got to be the guide that we follow, both for our governments 
and in the way we lead our own lives to try and create more happiness in the world around us. But would you accept that the word, and I, I'm, a, I'm aware of a, of a distinguished gentleman here who may want to join in shortly, but would you accept that the word happiness is uniquely unsuited for what we are talking about? It's uniquely suited. Happiness is used in two ways. One, as Jeffrey said, is the emotion. And it's not so good for these deep meaning of life issues that these two have been talking about. It's lovely for getting at that motion. You, I asked people were they happy, they knew precisely whether they were or not. Happiness is a wonderful word in this industry because it measures the emotion, which is an important part of the support for the broader life well lived, for which the question is, are you happy with your life as a whole? It's a judgment quite different from the emotion. I mean, if, I asked you, if I asked you, are you happy in your work? Would you think that was a trivial question? If I asked you, is your, your son happy at school? Is that a trivial question? Or is the fact that half the great novels in the, in, 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 that have ever been written, explicitly, they use this word, happy. War and Peace is about how do you find happiness. That's what it's about. Except until you take it out of this specific, is your son happy at school? Are you happy in your work? And you talk about a happiness, a happiness in life, a happiness in, uh, as indeed um, His Highness has been talking about. It always seems to me to be somewhat ill-suited. Well, can, can, if I could just tell you how we deal with this problem. Please. When we're, when we're talking about policy, uh, and I think all three of us would like policymakers to have this as their objective for their countries, we use the word life satisfaction because we find that is the one that's more acceptable to policymakers. After all, policymakers now, enlightened ones, have got used to asking, asking people, are you, are you satisfied with your police service? Are you satisfied with your health service? Why not just ask them just a little bigger question, are you satisfied with your life? And let's, let that guide them in the way they allocate all their money, they recruit people, they set their, their, their goals. It's interesting, by the way, if you think about it, what Thomas Jefferson wrote on July 4, 1776. <laughs> Wasn't life satisfaction. He didn't say life, liberty, and the pursuit of life satisfaction. Uh, so he said life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So that shows something. Let uh, alone pursuit of subjective well-being. Or subjective well-being. <laughs> <laughs> right, so how far, and then we'll come on to what your individual areas that I know you wanted to raise in this. Jeffrey, how far is it, do you think, the role of government to, whilst maybe, uh, to, to take a more, and I'll, I'll accept your word happiness with all the connotations that comes with it. How far is it the role of government to ensure the happiness or promote the happiness of their people? I think you could say that uh, for what government does, it should be keeping an eye on that uh, as a central objective. In other words, there are things government should not do. Stay out of my decisions on X, Y, and Z. Let me have freedom. But at the same time, there are many things government should do to make the environment safe, decent, fair, uh, and so forth, and, and, and the environment safe, by the way, so we don't destroy the planet in the meantime. And for that, the government should be taking uh, this view, what's really important for people in the society. And if you ask the question, should the government be promoting gross national product per person or happiness, I'd rather go with the happiness. Of course, the happiness includes some economic objectives, but it's not limited to economic objectives. And you, sir, of course, of the happiness, the, the, the various factors that make up the happiness research that you've done, the index. We tapped in in the World Happiness Report to six things, one of which is income, which is what the old goal was in a lot. And, and the second is a healthy life expectancy, which is kind of a gimme, it's, it's, it's got to be fundamental. Then we get into four that in some sense we regard as the social foundations of happiness, which are traditionally ignored. One is freedom to make your key life decisions. One is trust in the 
data we use, it's measured by uh, corruption, sense of corruption in, uh, in government or industry. A very important one that did, never got into the development literature early on is generosity. And the final one, I think I'm up to six now with the final one. Uh, just give me the, yeah, go on, final one. The, the, the final one is absolutely central to human well-being. And the question asked in the Gallup poll is a kind of crude yes, no one. If times of trouble, do you have someone to count on? Count on. So let me and just go, so, so you had income, freedom. Income, yeah. health. Income, health. Health, freedom. Freedom. It, Someone to count on, trust. generosity and trust. One, two, three, four. Was it income and health or income health? Income no. health, they're quite Two. separate. Two. Okay, right. Yeah. So, uh, we'll come to yours in a second, but yeah. let's put this to the test. You get one vote each. <laughs> one vote each. <laughs> and it's gonna be income, freedom, trust, generosity, health, or someone you can count on. Good. So, all those, you only get one vote, no double voting over here. <laughs> All those that would, as, they, as, their, as their most important barometer of happiness, income. <laughs> Two people, well, all right. <clears throat> Freedom. Trust. Health. Generosity. Good. Wow. <laughs> Someone you can count on. Every, I would think the majority of what went for health? Yes. You're surprised with that and bearing in mind your own view on this? No, absolutely right. Um, <laughs> and and, and when, when you ask people actually do a survey of what do people most want for themselves, it's health. Uh, and in particular, mental health. So I think that the lesson the most important single lesson of all of this work is that the priority that we give to mental health in our society and particularly in our healthcare services is just far too low. Uh, we have something like one in six of the adults in every society suffering from depression, anxiety. It's the biggest single cause of misery uh, I know in every country that I've studied. And yet, there's no country where even a third of those people are in any form of treatment, although really good treatments exist. And we can show, for example, we've rolled out a new service in England. It pays for itself because more people can work, they can pay taxes, they don't get the same physical illnesses. Huge savings because we've mobilized the human spirit. But that's to do with stigma, isn't it? There is no, still a... No. no, no, what I mean is the reason why there is still a... You know, as indeed the, work, the, the great work being done by um, the, uh, Prince William and, and, and Kate in terms of mental yeah, health yeah, and, and yeah. that foundation. That, there is still a stigma about that. But the reason for the stigma is mainly that people think nothing can be done about it. The same was true of cancer. People never talked about it. But when you can start to treat it, then people talk about it. But why do you put mental health up there as being one of the, why of all the, of all the Well, issues? because from, simply from this, this, the, the research that we've done, we can see that if you look at the people who are least happy, uh, a, a certain fraction of them are poor in every country, but a bigger fraction of them uh, are diagnosable with depression or anxiety disorders. So, so you're saying that, as I understand it, that if you treat those people properly and correctly, to, to use a better phrase, then you are, by definition, going to uh, increase the level of happiness. We've got very good evidence-based treatments, but also, of course, we should prevent mental illness by teaching the basic principles of happy living in schools, positive thinking, uh, managing your own emotions, caring for other people. There are, again, good evidence-based ways of doing this. Uh, yeah, yes, Jeffrey. I thought when you took the survey, one of the things that was interesting is other than income, by the way, which is also important, uh, but all the others got a pretty good share of the votes. And the findings are that they're all important. It's not that one or the other is. And I think it's important to stress, now I'm talking about his work, uh, but because uh, it's great, but I, I'm going to talk about it for a moment. The idea is not to create 
an index, the idea is to explain what people say about their happiness. So you ask them, how happy are you? How satisfied are you with your life on a scale from zero to 10? And then you see differences across countries. Some countries are very high. Denmark's always near the top or at the top. Yay, okay, <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, there's happiness, a lot of happiness up there near the Arctic Circle always. Um, and then you try to answer why are different places happy or not happy? So who is from Denmark? Are you oh, happy? <laughs> where, are, where are you, Denmark? That's quite a crowd. There, there. Do you have a microphone? No, anyway, who's from Denmark? Where are you? Stand up. Stand up. All the Danes stand why up. Why are you happy in Denmark? All the Danes stand up. There you go. Yes, why are you happy? You have a nice life. Why are they happy in Denmark, Jeffrey? You want to tell them why they're happy? Are they happy? Is that the question? Yeah, why are, why the, why are Denmark, the Danes happy? Why are they happy in Denmark? They, you know those six factors I gave you? Yes. They're high in all of them. To be in the top 10 in the world thing, you have to be right up there in everything. So it's a balance. They're not the richest country in the world. Right. Uh, but and but wait they, a minute. They, they we, have, we, much, we, they we have, have a, right here. A built-in ethic of respect for other people that your, your aim in life is to contribute to other people and respect them, rather than to show how different you are and how much more clever you are. Who watches House of Cards here? Okay, who has seen uh, Borja, the Danish version of this? Okay. Which country would you rather Wait a live minute. In? So look, in the Danish version of politics, the worst thing that happens is to use the wrong credit card. In the American version of politics, the guy throws the reporter in front of the train. That's okay, the difference sorry. of Denmark and the United States. All right, you've taken us elegantly into politics, Jeffrey. Yes. So, in this day and age, at the moment in time, to use every cliche, no discussion is complete exactly. without, without a, a tweet. Without a tweet <laughs> or the T word. Exactly. No, but I want to say oh. this, is, <laughs> this is not only That's about weird. politics. I mean, this is about how we lead, live our own right. lives. Uh, and I think that this great idea, this great enlightenment idea, uh, is a moral idea as well as a political idea that we should live our lives so as to create the most happiness we can in the world. And this is a, a really important message to young people who are looking for a sense of purpose. What am I here for? You're there to contribute to the happiness of the world. And we need, of course, not only the churches and mosques to preach this, but we need secular organizations. Right. And we have one wonderful one, chance to tell you, Action for Happiness. Look it up. You'll find it's a secular movement promoting living in a way that produces the happiness of others. I'm going to come back to Action for Happiness in a minute. Jeffrey, you believe, let's take the United States at the minute. Now, you described it to me earlier as rich, but not happy. Yes, indeed. Now, and bearing in mind, you come from a particular political point of view, don't yeah. you? Well, look, it's getting richer and less happy even, so it's, it's not just the paradox, and it's uh, of uh, being rich and not so happy. And this has been observed now for decades, actually three decades ago, a, a colleague uh, of ours in academia, uh, Richard Easterlin at University of Pennsylvania, made the observation that from the 60s to the 80s, the US had gotten richer, but the happiness report had not changed. If you now go 30 years on, the US has gotten a lot richer and the happiness is actually going down now. And if you go to John's six factors, you see in the United States very clearly, Americans don't trust each other as much as they used to and Americans don't trust the government at all. And that actually gives you some confidence that they have their eyes open uh, because there's nothing to trust right now. And, but this is, this is wearing on Americans. It's wearing on the whole world, by the way. 
But if you're in America right now, the fact that you, do, you just believe Congress is corrupt and, and it's been getting worse and worse is really why our happiness is failing. And it, it is partly about government because without government, we can't solve a lot of problems. It's not the only thing, but it's part of the story. John. John. I, something, there was a lovely set of papers yesterday. Those of you who heard them will, will Speak appreciate up, please. Sorry. There was a lovely set of papers yesterday, and there was a whole lot of factors that were brought out very clearly about how humans work. And they take in all this bad news and they internalize it and they get a negative cast of mind. It's part of what we've learned in the science is that you really have to turn off the bad news and concentrate on the good things and the positive things. I think in some sense that's a counterpoint between Richard was saying do some building and Jeffrey was, as a sense, complaining about the situation as it is. One thing, to, if you want to feel better about things, if you look at the geography of happiness and say, how much does your happiness depend on what happens at this distance with the people you live with and work with, and how much is based on what's going on in your capitals or elsewhere, 90% of the action on your happiness is right local. So and that's a, under your control to an extraordinarily great, so even if you're really depressed about your capacity to alter the framework with, in which you live, you can change things close to Where'd you start? A next elevator ride. Turn it from a prison sentence into a social event waiting to happen. How? Talk to the people. <laughs> They'll think you're barking mad. <laughs> and that'll, that'll make them feel better and, and make you feel better. <laughs> Any questions? Anybody want to join in? Because it's that sort of time of the day where people must have some thoughts on how it... Yes, sir. Do we have, any mic Do we have a microphone, by the way? Or... Oh, here we go. I do love these sort of evening events because they, <laughs> they become much more informal, don't they? <laughs> Barking mad, of course. But. I have a question uh, about the. There seems to be an obsession with uh, lumping all this sort of happiness into a single word. And in fact, you highlighted it by saying if you've got to choose one, which one do you choose? Why do you think there is that obsession to sort of uh, bring it down to one thing? Why do we want to bring happiness? Why did I want to bring happiness down to one word, do you think, Richard? Well, um, I, I think that. Uh, people have to make choices, uh, and they have to make choices with reference to some overall objective. And that applies to us, us individually, but it also very much applies to government. I mean, the Treasury is allocating money in the ways which would produce the most good in some way. Well, how, what's, what, what's the definition of good? We believe the good is the happiness of the people with, of course, particular weight to the avoidance of misery. The objection to the one word is the objection to there being one factor that makes you happy. I think what you're saying was there's a whole constellation of things that make you happy and their linkages. And I think that's a vital truth for you to raise and to, we have to remember. You, you don't have to choose. And, and the nice thing about happiness, unlike cars, ah, is the that- The reason I made them choose one word was so that we didn't get bogged down in a lot of airy fairy nonsense <laughs> before we'd even got started. But come on, yes. Good evening, my name is Farai Gundana Mason, a fellow at Harvard University. Um, last, at the last report, Burundi was uh, ranked last. And I'm wondering, the research, does it take into consideration historical, the, the history of a nation? And how can you compare uh, countries with differing uh, historical backgrounds? Right, Burundi was last. So Burundi was yes. last, apparently. Yes. Does the survey take into account historical background of the countries involved? The historical background is an enormously important determinant of all those variables. If, if some sense the historical background uh, is got some pain in it that isn't right. captured in those variables, then it'll turn out as below you know, our explanation. And there are a number of countries at the bottom of the list that really are less happy than they should be given the variables. And history is probably the shortcut reason for that. Jeffrey, what's the significance, though, of 
do you think of being at the bottom of the list? Why does it matter? Well, I think it raises a very important point. Countries at the bottom of the list have been terribly abused by a lot of countries near the top of the list. Absolutely. And so that's also part of a global moral responsibility. Yep. And countries at the bottom of the list that suffered colonialism, suffered uh, a lot of depredation, have the right to point out, by the way, you know, we're here in part because of the mess yes. that others made. And I think that that's, and by the way, continue to make. And so I think that this is a, a real factor that needs to be taken into account. It's not a matter of blame, it's a matter of understanding the situation. Sir. Good Thank point. you. Uh, so uh, as a behavioral scientist and also an LSE graduate, uh, I'm always showered with happiness, uh, happiness research. So I have just two questions. First is, how happy should we be? Where is the line that we should draw in terms of being happy or happy enough? This is first. Second is what comes after happiness. Once you reach happiness, perhaps boredom would kick in or perhaps right. other misery would kick in. So what would Brilliant question. Um, thank you. Brilliant question. So how happy, Richard, should we be? And once you've reached that level of happiness, what comes next? Well, I think that we would like a society in which everybody was very, very happy. Uh, there's nothing wrong in that. Uh, we, we don't want people, one person to be happy at the expense of other people. And if you're, you think you're as happy as you can get, you go and find someone who isn't and try and make them happier. Now, in the process, it'll make you happier still, but you can forget that. Just concentrate on making them happier. I think this enough question is really important because it applies a lot to wealth. Because one of the things you find is that there's a kind of saturation uh, and yet we seem to be driven still to want more even though there's no evidence that it does almost anything after a certain point. It's got at best a, what we call a logarithmic fit so that going from 500 to $1,000, a $500 increment has about the same benefit as going from 500,000 to a million. In other words, a $500,000 increment the one that's already rich, it's enough compared to other right, things but, in their life. But that, you know, I remember being told once, money doesn't buy happiness, right. but it does buy a very pleasant sort of misery. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that is correct. Well, right. Uh, Look, but a better, better dressed misery. Right, anyway. better, there's a bit of democracy here. We're supposed to finish in about two minutes. All those in favor of going on for another five or 10 minutes, raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an auction. <laughs> I'll start auctioning these gentlemen. A few more questions then. Yes. I have no idea what's the We're economists. Up. We want to know what's it worth it to you for another five minutes. <laughs> yes, sir. Dr. Ahmed Al Khazimi from uh, Ministry of Interior. My question in two parts. The first one. What's this business with two part <laughs> questions? <laughs> this is the fashion today. Right. Okay. Um, the first one, where's the spiritual life ah. located in these factors? The second one, our government uh, bring a new idea that's creating the hope for the new generations uh, develop the concept of happiness. How do you see this? Right, taking the first part, Richard, the okay. spiritual element in happiness, because you were talking about this earlier to yes. me. To explain. Well, uh, obviously happiness comes partly from without, but very largely from within. So it, it's very largely based on how you respond to what happens to you. So as the Stoics said, your, your, your ups, your un unhappiness, let's do that that way around. Unhappiness, is, they said, is not due to what happens to you, but how you react to what happens to you. So our, our inner strength and our sources of inner joy are extraordinarily important uh, as compared uh, with, they're important. What happens to us outside is also, also has some importance, but the, it's the interaction but you, uh, which is so important that we, we have the, the ability to create joy in ourselves, whatever happens right, to but us. You were talking to me earlier when you sort of said this idea of helping one another, the action for happiness that you were talking yes. about. Now, I said to you, isn't that just a, re a rephrasing of do unto others as you would have do unto yourself? Um, it is, um, but of course, uh, 
the question is exactly what they, are, they would like you to do for them. Uh, and I think the best concept of what other people would like you to do for them is to help them to be happy. And uh, the, the other really important part of this, of course, is that if you genuinely want other people to be happy, and I love the phrase that the, the monk Mathieu Ricard uses, unconditional benevolence. You should really, when you're sitting opposite the person in the tube, you should really want them to be happy. Why? <laughs> because, no, because... No, sorry, sorry. <laughs> you're not your, but why does my happiness <laughs> depend on your happiness? Because you're human. <laughs> <laughs> But, but here's the other point. I, we, we, we didn't finish the story. The story is, if you really want other people to be happy, you then get happiness from having done something that helps them. You don't get happiness from helping somebody in order to make yourself feel better. But if you really want to make the other person feel better, and you do, then you get happiness from it yourself. And that's a, a major source of happiness. The lady over here. Hello. My name is Natalia. I'm known as Mrs. Positivity, so it's all about being positive. Uh, what about the... Are you one of these distressing people that's always cheerful? No. No, no, no. This is my point. What about the element of being connected to yourself? Because happiness happens here. Jeffrey. And then... Oh, no, two, no two parties. No, no, no. I found my true happiness going through my hardest suffering. So I think Ooh. suffering is part of it. My journey with cancer is what brought me to happiness. So I think... What was the first part? It's being connected to yourself. I think the idea that uh, being connected to yourself, I'm going to go back again to the Greeks because I really like them. Uh, Socrates said, know thyself, and, and Aristotle said that... And Plato, his teacher, said that uh, contemplation was crucial for, for thriving. So I think that that is correct. Adversity, I would uh, hope that uh, we could avoid a lot of suffering. Uh, of course, reflecting on suffering and finding meaning, this is, comes back to this word spiritual that we didn't really talk about enough. Spiritual, to my mind, means purpose or meaning in life. And people find that in a lot of different ways. And I think that one of the findings about thriving is not that it's about sensations, right. Uh, and always pleasure and so forth. It's about meaning and purpose. And that is, I think, a spiritual kind it, of value. Including facing adversities and surmounting them. That's, that was All the right. point, and I think it's critically important. O overcoming suffering is, of course, very, very important. But th I think the idea that there is any value, intrinsic value, in suffering is the most dangerous idea. Uh, the definition of Puritanism, H.L. Mencken, you probably know it. Puritanism, the dreadful fear that someone somewhere may be happy. <laughs> uh, that's what we're up against. We, we seriously well, are up against it. The last question, <laughs> no pressure. Question. Yeah, so I think my name is Gustavo Payan. I'm with the Harvard Kennedy School. And I think, first of all, happiness will be a job with Professor Sachs. Um, and secondly, uh, is that's creeping? <laughs> that's is, just is 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 happiness contagious? Ah. Can you talk about age uh, as a factor of happiness? Fine. Is happiness contagious? Definitely. No, definitely. It's look at look. Throughout look, the room. Look. <laughs> There's no antidote. <laughs> as, as Sir Christopher Wren said, if you want a monument, look around. All right. <laughs> final final thought from each of you. Give our guests here one piece of oomph that they can take with them, that they can shake hands with the person next to them, the one thing that they should do. Start with you, sir. I gave you the elevator. If you don't like to ride in lifts, you can do it on the flat ground. <laughs> what should they do? Just talk to each other. Absolutely. That's where you start. Then you can apply Richard's lesson, but you first of all have to take that move outside your inside self and connect with others. Jeffrey. There is no barrier to uh, preventing the spread of much more well-being in the world. And every country at the bottom of the list has every reason to expect and to be able to achieve huge gains of happiness. 
and deserve the help to do so. Your Lordship, you get the last word. Advice. Join our movement. Action for <laughs> happiness. <laughs>